Thank you, Jody, for the info. It was a quick Google for me. 10 to 11 weeks for average vulture to leave the nest. And I thought about three or four months. But our local pair of vultures whose nest that is, they, they've got jackpots kind of thing. You know, they, don't have, they don't have far to go home. Morning, everybody. Okay, before you all fly off, let's just get a look at you. It's got to be the classic African scene. This, you know, the dead tree, hungry vultures, hunched up, waiting for their turn. Let's see if we move in and then see what we can see here. It's from this point on that I advise everybody to start breathing through their mouth. Don't breathe through your nose. It reaches a point where actually you can't breathe through your nose. Exciting, creeping through tall vegetation. So, oh, there's a hyena. I see it now. There's a giraffe. I see some hyena. I was going to say it's kind of exciting, creeping through this vegetation, knowing there's a dead animal on the ground, and knowing that there could be a predator under any one of these bushes. coming to greet us. Hello little one. Oh, this is a big giraffe. One of the cubs from last year. Well, I mean maybe the year before. Hello little one. A little fluffy and wet. That's why the vultures aren't here. The hyenas aren't letting them come in yet. This vulture, this, sorry child. Looks like this giraffe's been here a few days already. Big male.
It's quite likely he he was just an old man. Quite a dark skin. Big giraffe males do have a tendency to darken with age. Not even full bellied and it's leaving the carpet. And we're very lucky and we actually can't smell it from here. And although there's no wind, there is air movement because I was smelling it on Twin Dams Road and there was that leopard that was on Twin Dams Road closer to the dam. But of course much subtle sense, much more subtle sense of smell means that that leopard could probably pick it up at some point and maybe come and investigate. It would be nice. I'm just looking at the way this hyena is pulling at that. I think this, this is probably quite hard and dry. It seems to have been here a while already. Judging by other signs, I can see some feathers on the ground. I can see a lot of white guano from the vultures. So the vultures have been down on the carcass. Spent a lot of time there, no doubt. And I think on account of it maybe of being, having been here for a few days already, it might be getting quite difficult for animals to get underneath the tough hide. Two of the vultures that are closest to this carcass are the smaller hooded vultures. Because as soon as, as soon as there's a moment for those vultures to come in, when the predators have left, it would be important for those little hooded vultures to get in here quickly and try and get something before this, the hordes of white-backed vultures come in and dominate. And then perhaps, out of the blue, I mean literally out of the blue will come a huge leopard-faced vulture. and just intimidate its way into the carcass through the hordes of white-backed. Being a young hyena, it's quite vulnerable. And you can see how nervous it is. 
it is looking around a lot. It'll feed for a while, but it looks around, looks up every now and then. While it's feeding, it's making a noise, and it's got to stop and listen. So it's a, quite a wise youngster, already knowing that there's a possibility of a larger lion or, a, or even a leopard. I mean, it's quite easy for a leopard, even one of the boys, to come in and chase that youngster away. Although not likely for a leopard to do that. not knowing if there are other hyenas that are going to come to its aid. But yeah, at the moment, the greatest threat to this little hyena, the pride of lion, seeing all these vultures, picking up on the scent, honing in on it and rushing in to feed. And a young hyena feeding on the carcass has got no defense other than to run away if it can. Jennifer was asking about these vultures, wondering if there were no dead trees around. Would the vultures use live trees? Yes, they would. Vultures will use anything they can to perch on. Obviously, a lot easier for them to land on the dead trees. It gives them a better view of things. They'd even land on the ground in cases like Serengeti, places where there's open grassland. They'd hang out on the ground some distance from the carcass if there was still a predator feeding. One of the adults coming in now. The youngster being very submissive, tail between the legs, crouching down, tail going up. Probably even urinating. And newcomer got to roll in it. The youngster's trying to claim the carcass. Look at that vulture, heating up its wing. <coughs> Looks like a youngster, that's probably one of the youngsters. 
life back. That wing doesn't look very large. Ooh. Hyena came to my door. Came around here and brought a whiff of that carcass. Yeah, it's circular, circling up. Thank you, hyena. I was sitting here without the scent of it up till now. Sun helps harden those feathers, helps discourage parasites. Also, I noticed a very interesting thing. There are four ducks. You can just see them passing the vultures. Just went past the vultures now. In the way in the background, there were four ducks flying this way. And it was almost like a, an air show with the silver falcons or whatever they call them. They were flying in perfect formation and suddenly they must have seen just a horde of vultures in their midst. And they all turned off to the side rapidly and did a loop and have gone around. They must be going to the dam. Giving this area a wide berth. The hyena have left by the looks of things. Probably gone to bed. Confident that there'll still be plenty this evening when they wake up. And it's now that it's maybe the the vultures might start coming in. Ah, as I say, it's the first one to arrive. One of the hooded. The starling that's coming. I think it was the starling that got here first and the vulture was feeling it. The starling can be there, so can I. So the two hooded vultures arrive, and we're going to see now maybe that they've arrived and they've flown down. Actually the hyenas coming back. Watch this. The young hyena is not going to like the vultures on its giraffe. Probably doesn't want to feed at all, just wants to get rid of the, the, the vultures. <laughs> They're not too intimidated. <laughs> Makes a bit of a half hearted rush at them. Something like that can go on for hours where neither of them get to feed because the vultures will tease the hyena. Fly up and Okay, Volta gave up. Now the next one. Morning Vivian, nice to hear from you. Vivian says she understands that the giraffe 
giraffe died from natural causes and not from a predator, lion or leopard. As far as I know, Vivian, well, the only thing that's going to kill a giraffe of this size, really, is going to be lion. And they would still be here. Lion would be here. They'd pretty much go through the carcass over a three, four day period. And I guess since I haven't heard anybody talking about lion on this giraffe, I can guess we can rule out the fact that it wasn't killed by lion. It appears to be a big male giraffe. Unfortunately, the carcass is very far gone. And we can only assume it died of natural causes. After all the activity that's been around there, and there's very bare soil around the legs and around closer to the carcass. So it's hard to tell whether there was thrashing of the legs or not. That's something that you can only tell when the carcass is still fairly fresh because that could mean that could mean a little bit of struggling when the animal is down it doesn't take a giraffe very long to die once it's on the ground like that but from what I can see from the angle that I'm at it looks like a big male and it possibly or most likely just reached it was the end of his it was the end of his time. So hyenas moved off again. Accomplished what it came back to do, getting the vultures back into a tree. Vultures watch the hyena and the hyena is now fifty yards away, heading down towards the Mawati. And as soon as it's out of sight the vultures are gonna come back again. Hello Pam. And Pam was asking if it is possible that a snake could have bitten the giraffe and if so what kind of snake? I guess it's possible. I mean if I would imagine maybe puff adder. I don't know what a giraffe's uh, how a giraffe would be affected by the cytotoxic venom of a puff adder. But if a giraffe were to fall like that, it would be maybe cobra or mamba. But I have to be honest with you, I'm not too sure of the incidence of snake bite with large mammals. I think it's pretty hard to determine. It could have been an infestation of internal parasites. It could have been weakening of its system from an infestation of ticks. That can happen when an old when a giraffe starts getting old. That tick infestation can start weakening the immune system and weakening it, the, the animal itself. Um, there are a host of diseases that animals can get or carry them. That's going to wait a little bit longer, see if any of the larger vultures arrive. There are so many of them in the trees. <coughs> Just to see if there's any interaction between these smaller hooded vultures and here comes one of the white-backed. Oh. Nearly dropped down. A bit of a low flying gamble there. I think we are a little intimidating to the vultures, but if we sit quietly, it should, shouldn't take too long.
it's very hard for vultures to sit in a tree and see other vultures feeding. Now what I'd like you to notice here, the difference in the size of the beak of this white-backed vulture that's just arrived and these little hooded vultures. See how narrow their beaks are compared to that white-backed. Apart from the size difference of the bird itself. And that's one of the reasons why these little hooded vultures have to be here. They've got to try and get to some of the softer parts. They've got to try and get in there before these big boys arrive, big boys and girls. Number two has arrived. Come children, breakfast up. Well, the easiest place for them to feed right now is where the hyenas have been chewing. bubbling already. A couple of nice things to note here. First of all, these large mammals have got a very thick skin and when a carcass has been lying in the hot sun, of course it does tend to dry out a little bit and get very, very hard. It can be very difficult to tear through. The leopard-faced vulture will be able to do that. So the easiest place for these animals to feed is where the skin has been torn already by the larger predators, the lion and hyena, although we haven't had lion here. And they will then be able to get to the flesh underneath the skin. And of course that means sticking your head right into that gory mess. And that's one of the reasons why vultures don't have feathered heads and necks. Oh, they have these seemingly bald heads. It's just a soft down, much easier to keep clean. They don't want to have feathers that are going to get clogged with blood and gore and matted. A little bit more hygienic. A number of vultures are flying closer to some of the dead trees close by. So slowly but surely they're moving in.
thought a vulture could get a gag reflex. Jennifer was asking if they land in the green trees. We just had a vulture landing in the marula tree. Very badly. Almost like a crash landing. The funniest thing is seeing them arrive in numbers and filling up the dead trees. And of course, dead trees being dead. A lot of tunnels bored into them by the lava of beetles and termites and all sorts of things a lot of them sometimes can't handle the weight and it'll be quite comical some to see a branch that can carry two vultures and then suddenly the third one lands and of course then it breaks and the three of them it's almost like in a cartoon gravity takes effect before they realize they're falling and then suddenly the wings open and they fly off I missed out on counting now, but that's probably about, I think, six, about six white-backed vultures that have arrived now. So there's going to be a little bit of bickering starting. Yeah, they're starting to fight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven white-backed vultures. That is mantling, what it is doing now. That one on the left, holding its wings out like that. You find eagles will do that as well. They'll mantle their prey. Creating a, a larger persona, just intimidating the others around it. And getting more space around it for feeding. lot more activity all around us as vultures are starting to come in from these trees that are way out 100 200 meters away coming into some of the trees closer by and of course as each vulture comes in closer so another one feels left out and thinks that it's got to get in there first so there's as much activity going on around us changing positions in trees as there is here on the ground already Days warming up. I 
I think by this afternoon it's going to be almost impossible to sit here because of the the smell of the carcass. But we can. We'll try and come back later. With this many vultures, there'll be a considerable change in this, in what it looks like by this afternoon. Morning, Jody. Two questions from Jody, and I think I'll start with the second one. Why don't all the vultures mantle? I think it's Jody. It's all got to do with hierarchy and who feels stronger. You can see some are more submissive than others. It's got to do with who gets there first. Who has prime position, trying to protect a particular spot on a carcass where it's easier to get it uh, at the flesh. Getting interesting now because there are too many vultures for the access point. And now I've forgotten what other question Jody had. Oh. question that Jody had was what's the difference between a buzzard and a vulture? That's kind of a difficult question to answer because in North America I think the vultures could be referred to as buzzards for some reason and everybody I mean, when the word buzzard is used it, it, it has it conjures up images of an animal on scavenging on a carcass. Whereas I think in ornithological terms a buzzard is a is is, is one of the birds of prey. It's a hunter more than a scavenger. Uh, we have yeah we have the jackal buzzard, the honey buzzard, the step buzzard. They're more hawk like than buzzard like. And they're not vultures, they're not they don't scavenge. They all hunt live prey. 
But then, if I'm not mistaken, in North America, the turkey vulture is also known as the turkey buzzard, isn't it? I need correction on that. But the turkey vulture is considered a buzzard, isn't it? So I think in some cases, the buzzard is used as a generic term for scavengers. Perhaps, perhaps, by the... I don't want to use the word, the term less educated. I mean, by the layman who's not familiar with the proper terminology in ornithological terms. People who are not familiar with nature will think of buzzards coming down to a carcass. When in fact it's vultures that will come down to a carcass and buzzards that will hunt live prey. So it's terminology and it's and it's unique to different areas. I don't think we would ever use the term buzzard when referring to any of the vultures in Africa. Because when we talk of buzzards we talk of specific birds of prey that are a distinct family. The two, who are, the two little hooded vultures have now completely been intimidated. Here comes a hyena scattering the vultures. Get off of my meat, it's saying. So, of course, there's a mad dash for the dead trees, and they can't all fit in the trees. So now the fighting goes from fighting over food to fighting over perches. But, yeah. I mean, it might not be hungry, but it just can't stand the sight of vultures feeding on its carcass. It would be interesting to sit here all day, but I think we need to maybe make our way around, back around to Gauri Dam. Look for that elephant. Good morning, Mary. Mm. Interesting concept that. Mary is saying that she has heard a large giraffe can die of lightning strikes. That is possible. But that predators will avoid the carcass of a giraffe that's struck by lightning. Is this true or a legend, urban legend? Well, I have to be honest, Mary, I've never heard that before. I can't imagine why lion or hyena would ignore a giraffe being struck by lightning. <coughs> I can't say I can't say I could uh, comment on it. I mean, I'd I would discard it as legend, urban legend, and, and and not true. Having not heard anything like that, having not seen, more than not heard, but having... I've never seen a giraffe carcass that has never been touched before. I've seen buffalo carcasses that don't get touched, but that's because there's just so much meat. That's because of the numbers of buffalo dying or being killed. And the hyenas and the lions just f feeding too much, not having any space to feed on more. Another hyena making its way in, back in. Bit of a breeze that's starting to pick up now as the day wears on. Air is starting to warm up, thermals are starting to turn. We might start seeing some more vultures flying in from the distance. 
but I think more importantly for us, that is, in our comfort. It's easy for you to sit at home and watch this through a TV set. As it starts warming up and the carcass starts warming up and the air starts turning around us, it becomes a little bit unbearable at times. I can't even describe the smell to you. <laughs> Cat's not enjoying it. Oh, that's a very interesting one from Anson. Morning, Anson. In New York, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong there. But Anson was saying, how would the vultures find this carcass to begin with? Would they see it or would they smell it? And why that is such an interesting question is because we would refer to these vultures, all these African vultures, as old world vultures. Africa being old world as opposed to the New World vultures, which you will find in North America. And all of the Old World vultures find their carcasses by sight rather than smell. I mean, when you look at the face of a vulture from Africa versus the face of a vulture from the Americas, and you look at the nose, the, the, the holes in the beak that are the nose, You'll see that in the New World vultures, the North American vultures, how large, look at the condor for example, how huge those holes are in their beak, their nose, as opposed to these African vultures. African vultures, ah, they do smell, but they don't find anything by smell. They don't locate by smell. They locate by sight. And it's a very interesting uh, concept of how things are fat. Look, this is a giraffe. It's huge. And a huge giraffe will be seen from even 5,000 feet up there from a vulture circling at, at that height. But you see, vultures don't just fly anywhere. They don't, when they're circling up in the sky, it's not just, it's not a random altitude that they're, they're circling at. They can't circle very low, the very large vultures. They need much stronger air currents, so they need to be flying higher up. And it's the smaller birds that are flying lower altitudes. And one of the lowest flying scavengers is the likes of the batelier, or the tawny eagle, or these hooded vultures. They all fly very low, 100 to 200 feet. I can't really imagine a tawny eagle worrying about a big uh, giraffe carcass like this. Tawny's a, tawny eagle's going to go for a smaller carcass. But the batelier and the hooded vultures flying at one or two hundred feet are the ones that are going to find the carcass. And they're going to find even the smallest of things like the afterbirth of an impala or even the afterbirth of a steenbuck. Even the remains. I mean, we saw... A while ago, we saw those cheetah make that kill, and those vultures came in, and all that were left were the tiny little legs of a baby impala. The other thing that vultures are going to do is, they, especially the likes of hooded vultures, they're going to follow. Sorry, some interesting interaction with the hyena there, submissive behaviour, as the other one came in. But apart, all right, I've just got to go back a few steps here because you'd have vultures like these two hooded vultures. Other, I've seen hooded vultures following predators, spending day after day after day with the same predators. In fact, I used to go back in Tanzania <coughs> many years ago. There was a pack of wild dogs that had resident vultures that followed them everywhere because the, and they were hooded vultures. And what it is, is when the hooded vultures are either flying at 100 or 200 feet or following the predator or sitting in a tree where there is a predator, they're going to be seen by the vultures flying slightly higher than that, the likes of the white-headed 
or the white-backed vulture that flies a little bit higher or up in East Africa, the griffon. Those vultures are not necessarily looking for a carcass or a little bone in the, in the grasses. They're looking at the trees. They're looking at the soaring, or they're soaring higher than the hooded vultures, and they're looking down, watching the hooded vulture in the battalier go down onto the ground, and that's what's going to attract their attention. And by the same token, the vulture, like the lappet, the huge lappet faced vulture that's flying two, three, maybe even 4,000 feet, is not necessarily going to see a carcass from that height. What it's going to do is it's going to see the hordes of white backed vultures below it honing in on a carcass and it's going to follow them. So when you look at that whole scenario, the concept that we call vulture stacking in terms of the, the altitudes that they fly and how they come into a carcass. It's only really one or two birds that is going to find the carcass and just the fact that they find it is what is going to attract the attention of other vultures flying higher than them to bring the other vultures in. And of course once you get one or two vultures sitting in a tree like this, it's, going to attract, it's just going to keep bringing more and more vultures in. So the number of vultures is going to be directly related to the size of the carcass to some extent and how long those vultures sit around. A vulture flying over now it will fly over and see all of these vultures sitting in these trees. Now these vultures would have been here since yesterday. There's no way that any of these vultures came in early this morning. They would have come in from considerable distance away, some of them, and they would have been sleeping over from yesterday, having arrived on thermals either yesterday or the day before. And as the thermals are starting to form now and the air starts warming up and birds from afar start flying, they'll see hordes of vultures in the trees around here and immediately come in because they'll know that it's got to be something big to have this many vultures overnighting in one place. The vulture was flying in and was about to land and was intimidated by a woodland kingfisher. Morning to Maya or Maya. Interested, I'd like to know how to pronounce that. Maya. Referring to the buffalo that we had at the dam last year at, from the camera at the dam. When the lion had finished with that buffalo, those vultures flew in. I mean, they swarmed that buffalo carcass and finished the whole thing in an hour or two. Uh, wanting to know why is it taking so long to finish off this giraffe? And mostly because this giraffe appears to have been here for some time now and a lot tougher skin, a lot thicker skin. I mean that whole neck of that giraffe. We've got to wait for these hyena do, to do what they're doing now, is get through the skin. And now we've got this hyena starting to open it, the one on the left there is opening up the skin on the neck. The jaw of the hyena is unmatched. Vultures can't get into that the, the neck of that giraffe unless the hyena or the rest of the body, the shoulders, the meat around the shoulder blades, the thighs, see both of the legs are still there, even the four four legs. Vultures are not going to be able to get through that skin now. It's, it's a little bit too old. Some of the bigger vultures might have been able to do it when the carcass would have been fresh, but it's only after the hyena feeding. Oh, here's one of the youngsters. That was one of last year's babies. Tiny little one, that one. Three hyena. Well, I'm just seeing how the whole carcass moves when the hyena pulls on it. That, that's pretty tough for these vultures to get through. So.
it's going to take a while. I mean, when we saw the vultures a few minutes ago, before the hyena came back, they were concentrating on the areas where the hyenas had been feeding because those are the places where it's easier for them to get into it. And there's limited space for vultures to get in there, apart from the fact that they intimidate each other and they fight over those tiny little spaces. So it is going to take some time. Complaining about another hyena of lesser stature. Why are you running away now? I wonder if they do that on purpose. They come and open up the skin a little bit and then leave. And of course the vultures will come in and tear it apart a little bit more. And then the hyena will come back and chase the vultures to get to even fresher meat perhaps. I don't know what where the fresh can be used in this sense. <coughs> Ooh, it's suddenly quite chilly sitting here in the shade. A bit of a breeze starting to pick up. Fortunately blowing the other way. Hi Lisa, thanks for the info. And Lisa is saying that she was reading about bald eagles following turkey vultures. Opportunism, opportunism in nature is, is an interesting subject and we could talk about it for days because you want to remember there's an incredible brain behind everything. Everything's got a brain and not entirely governed by instinct. And if you can get another animal to do your dirty work or to do the hard work and then use your size and strength to intimidate that animal, then, well, why not? See how goshawks follow mongoose, how carmine beaters use the bustards, how the drongos use elephants. Innumerable examples of how animals will use each other to have better access to food or make it easier to find or catch food.
Ephraim, come in. Uh, what's that lock, please? Copy, thanks. Is Hyena watching behind us a lot and then trotting off? I don't know if there is something behind us. That's intimidating them. But, time to move on. Hoping there's time to go up to the northwest. We can come back and see how things have changed a little later. <clears throat> Bye everybody, enjoy your stinky meal. <laughs>